Well, recently my uh, wife and I and a few family members <clears throat> and friends started out on a 30-day quest. This quest involved dramatically changing our eating habits, especially those of myself. Because, you know, being celiac isn't hardcore enough. I need to bump it up many, many more notches and removed not just gluten that I cannot eat, but sugar, dairy, and even alcohol. Now only, I think we're only outdone by this diet by fourth level vegans who don't eat anything that casts a shadow. But this diet is supposed, the whole purpose of it, and it's called the Whole30. Besides, the idea is to remove processed foods from your diet and to try to kind of clean your system up a little bit. Besides having, you know, just the processed food, it aims to, as they say, target people's habits and emotional relationships with food. Which might sound silly, your relationship food. Then I remember my Lamar's Donuts frequent buyer card that I carry around with me still. I'm still on their mailing list, and I haven't been able to eat donuts for years now. <laughs> It's a great store. It's a great donut. So this book has a chart in it that shows you during this 30-day quest, most likely how you're going to feel in those first 30 days as you give up all of these uh, foods that you might have normally been eating. And it begins with a hangover, and then you move into a spot where it says kill all the things. That's how you feel. Then you move into I just want a nap. And that's week one. Week two is the hardest days, ending with I dream of junk food. And we're just finishing up week two now. And this is the time that most people, if they do this, uh, most people quit if they don't stay with this diet the whole time. What we're looking forward to this next week, what I've been promised is going to happen, week three promises, and it calls it tiger's blood. That's the goal that I'm hoping to get to because I'm tired, I'm cranky, I dream about sugar and pancakes. When everybody, when we talked about this, was really excited about this idea that we had before we started. And after we started, we lost one person on day one. Another fell by the wayside during the hardest days part. But four of us are still standing strong. Yes, of course, this has great spiritual analogies. <laughs> the one thing I realized during week one, when I was cranky, when I was tired, when I had a constant headache, when I was constantly hungry, when food that I was supposed to be eating wasn't fulfilling me, wasn't, my body wasn't telling me, or my body was telling me it wasn't getting the sugar that it normally thought it should be getting, was how my body relied on those processed sugars as a major, major source of energy. My body was telling me that I, you need this. You've given this up. You need this to get on with life, which I didn't. Now that I've been eating a little bit healthier and removed that completely gone cold turkey, I found I don't have those cravings. I don't need that sugar, the sugary foods, whatever I was eating before as much. It's only after having removed them from my system that I can start relying upon those other forms of nourishment. You know, when we reach out, when each of us reached out to the promises of Christ, and when we put our proverbial, our hands in that proverbial plow to go forward, we agreed to change. To change completely, to change cold turkey, to not go back to those spiritually sugary things that we were so entrapped by. In Luke 9, Luke chapter 9, in verse, starting in verse 57. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that some, someone said to him, speaking to Christ, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, Follow me. 
But he said, Lord, let me go bury the, uh, my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. You know, we can't rely on those things that seemed important to us in the past. No matter how much they pull us back into it. And these weren't bad things that these people were talking about. Burying their father, going to say goodbye to their friends and relatives, maybe, in this instance, when they were following after Christ. But they were things that were pulling them, those people, away. They were attitudes that were pulling them back, which Christ saw, which Christ warned his disciples, those that wanted to preach and follow after him that they could not go back to. You know, we must push forward towards that ultimate goal of the kingdom of God. That willingness to labor for that goal, which makes it us fit to receive it. That's how we can achieve this goal, is by laboring towards it. Doing whatever we can to remove our previous life from our attitudes from our outlook and going forward and we are in fact expected to labor for this promise and I'll just quote a few examples where the ministry referred to themselves as these in first Thessalonians 3 2 and Timothy and and sent Timothy our brother minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish and encourage you concerning your faith and Philemon 1.1, 1, 1. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. And in Philemon 1.24, as do Mark, Aristocrus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. We are expected to labor after this great promise. You know, we all jumped over that first hurdle overcoming our sinful nature when we were baptized. But that is only the first hurdle in our lifelong race. You know, Paul talks about the race that we are all trying to run in, the race that we're all trying to win. And most might assume it's a flat track with the finish line. But I've always looked at it more of a hurdle race. In high school, I ran, and maybe that's why I think of it this way, I ran the 110 high hurdles. It was very important when you began that race to set your pace at the start so that that first jump, or that you hit that first jump and that first hurdle correctly. But once you got over that first hurdle, your race began. That's where your endurance showed. You had nine more hurdles to jump over in order to finish that race. How well you kept pace throughout the rest of that race was determined, one, by how well you started, how well you over, got over that first hurdle, but it became easier. And when you walked up to a hurdle, even, it seemed like it's way too hard to, or way too high just to jump over standing still. But it was with speed, it was with agility, being able to jump over that, that helped you run through the entire race doing that. And for us spiritually, it's God helping us achieve the end of this race by helping us jump over these massive hurdles that we cannot complete, cannot get over on our own. It's with his spirit that we can jump over these and continue to jump over and keep our focus as we go through this race. You know, the hardest part of our conversion will be overcoming our sins. You know, each sin is a hurdle we must leap over, that we must conquer, that we must put behind us. And those hurdles are going to be with us as long as we are carnal. They will not leave us until we, are be we become spirit beings. But we know that doing so, that this race can will be won. Christ did. In John 16, We know that our elder brother finished this race, and we are given that example. John 16, and verse 33. 
These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. We will have tribulation when we live this way of life. We will have those hurdles put before us, but with Christ's example, with God's help, we can overcome them. And this is only possible, Christ finishing this race, this is only possible because he sustained himself on godliness, complete reliance on godliness. And it's like we must do if we wish to finish this race and achieve that promise. 1 Peter 2, First Peter 2 and starting in verse 1. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. You know, in Romans, this section entitled, Behave Like a Christian, at least in the New King James Version, Paul lists many attributes for how Christians should behave. And it's in chapter 12, verses 9 through 20, but I'll just pick up some of those verbs and some of those attributes that we should be following after. It talks about abhorring this world, clinging being kindly, not lagging, fervent for, serving the Lord, rejoicing, patient, continually steadfastly, distributing, blessed, or blessing, living peaceably. And he ends this list, if you will, turn with me to Romans 12 and verse 21. He ends this list of as an example, of, so we know how we're supposed to, he's given a list of how we're supposed to behave as Christians. But he ends in verse, or chapter 12, verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Well, brethren, that is a call for us to not just sit back and react to whatever the world gives us, to whatever hurdles are presented for us, but when we see one of those hurdles that's in front of us and our promise to get up and overcome, 